Welcome to Fireside Nets with Spen and Nick, brought to you by Empire Sports Media. I am your host, Spen. He's my brother, Nick. It is Tuesday, April 27th. Horns. The devil horns. Tuesday, April 27th, and our mother's birthday is tomorrow. My question to you, Nick, is what did you get, Randy? BT dubs, for the listeners out there, Randy is our mom. I got her some uh, back stage passes to see uh, Michael Bublé in concert. Did you actually? No, those are incredibly expensive. And I don't think she's a huge Michael Bublé fan. She actually, uh, she loves the boobs. No, dad likes Michael Bublé because we both were reminiscing the other day about that song Home he sings. And it's really sad because it's like he goes on tour. He has all this money and fame, but he just wants to go home to his family. Everybody knows the best Michael Bublé song is Quando, Quando, Quando. It's a terrible song. It's like a guy trying to sing Spanish and he only says one word. I think he does it with Nelly Furtado, if I'm not mistaken, but it's a great song. No, I think he does it with Nelly from Nellyville. Oh, okay. So you haven't gotten mom anything yet and her birthday's tomorrow. No, I'm like, a, I'll hit you with a prize when you least expect it kind of guy. That makes zero sense in regards to her actual birthday on Wednesday. Uh, I haven't gotten her anything yet, but I'm going to get her something really nice when we're done with this podcast. You'd like a gift card to like a Thai restaurant or, or a brassiere? You're going to get our mom a brassiere for her birthday. We're not going to say the age on here. Well, no, it wouldn't be for me. I would say it's from dad because I'm, right, let, I'm like a sick wing. I'm like a wingman son. Let's stop with this conversation. Our mother's a foodie. You're probably going to get her a food gift card. I'll probably do the same. Maybe we can kind of work out a joint gift where we get her like $200 to Capitol Grill or something. Yeah, maybe some red wine from Total. All right, Nick. I want to get something off my chest that's been bothering me. This whole Knicks versus Nets narrative that has began to play out over these last few weeks after the Knicks have been scorching hot in in, the, in their last nine games. I think they're on a nine-game winning streak headed into the game. I mean, we're recording on Monday night. Uh, this will be released Tuesday morning. I just want to look. I know they were were, were locked in with the Phoenix Suns, um, but they are hot. They're, they're on a nine. Okay, so they're up four in the third quarter. Um, but they've kind of gotten cocky, the Knicks fans have. You know, now we're seeing fuck the Nets chance after Knicks games. We're seeing this narrative of nobody in New York cares that the Nets are good because everybody who's ever stepped foot in any of the five boroughs is a Knicks fan. And then finally, we, we get horrible, outrageous takes like this. So I'm going to read you a tweet from Anthony Donahue, and I just I want your, your reaction to this. Who is, has, that? who is that? He's a guy on Knicks Twitter. He's a, he's a big Knicks fan. I think he goes on MSG Network a little bit. I looked at his profile. He didn't seem like uh, a guy worth worth paying that much attention to. I prefer J. Anthony, Anthony Jeselnik. PSA, speaking for all Knicks fans, we don't care about KD or Kyrie. I'll even say we're happy we didn't get them. We are good <laughs> and moving in the right direction. On with your days, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, because I would say most sports fans are like, yeah, I'd rather start building and win in 10 years than win now. Cause we don't like to win now. We like that. It's like, that's like the Mets fan mentality of like, we're just getting better year after year. And I love Mets fans and I like going to Mets games. So I, I no shade on the Mets. That's such a dumb logic. That's like a bitter little bitch logic. Like, oh man, like we don't even want those guys. Cause we're in fourth in the East in a shitty ass fucking division. The East is not great. You have three teams and then everybody else is pretty much the same. The wizards are going to somehow make the playoffs. And their, their team is Westbrook, Bradley Beal, and then nine big men who were kicked off of every other team they ever played on. I mean, and RIP uh, uh, of D, uh, the Israeli guy. Um, he didn't die. He just got hurt exactly after the season. Um, it's just such silly lie. And you know what's funny? Nets fans don't get that upset with, like, Knicks doing well. We don't, like, we, we're so used to being the underdog and performing poorly. We're just kind of like, hey, man, we're just glad we're in it. Like, I have, do I hate the Knicks? Yes. Do I want them to lose? Yes. Am I going out of my way? I'm not even paying attention to their games. I have not watched a Knicks game this season I, I, unless listen, they're playing the Nets. I'm, I'm man enough to admit that if the Nets aren't on, I have been watching the Knicks. Look, I, I want to see 
them play. I want, I want to see Randall. I want to see Barrett. This is no shade at the Knicks as a team, because I do think they're a young, well-coached team. And I'll get into, you know, you got to love Thibodeau and you got to love D Rose. By the way, the Israeli guy you were referencing is Denny Avdija. He, he heard his, yeah, that's uh, what I said. Uh, he, he had a really bad leg injury a few games ago, but back to the Knicks. So a few things here, by the way, if Anthony Donahue wanted to take it a step farther, he could have said in hindsight, when Randall and Kevin Durant were both available, I'm glad we took Randall. I'm glad we signed Reggie Bullock over Kyrie Irvin because that's how most NBA fans probably think, right, Nick? Yeah, I mean, I, Julius Randall. Julius Randall's dope. I will. I will have no hate on Julius Randall. He's the man. He's crushing it. I thought he he was never appreciated on the other teams he had been on. He was always in the shadow of kind of more elite big men or or more sought after big men, big men with higher expectations. So it's it's really cool to see him here. Don't tell me though that with a gun to your head you take Julius Randall over Kevin Durant if they're both free agents and he's not actually already in your uniform. Yes, preach, preach. Few things here, Nick. The Knicks fans chanting, fuck the Nets. This means we're in their head. We've been in their head for a year and a half. Okay? No Knicks fan thought that they would have the season they're having this year. And if they did, they were delusional. Nobody, nobody thought that they'd be the fourth seed in the East this late in the season. But the fact that after their wins, they're literally saying, fuck the Nets, is, sh- is such a sign of jealousy. It's just a, it's such a sign of like, Hey guys, look where we are, but we're still not you guys. So we're going to talk trash. Do you ever see Nets fans after games chanting, fuck the Knicks? No, because Nets fans don't give a flying fuck about the Knicks. So that's number one. Number two, this may be a surprise to all the people on Knicks Twitter, but some people in Brooklyn and Manhattan actually like the Nets. They exist. They might not be as loud and obnoxious and as as large as as the Knicks fans population, but 100%, I interact with thousands of people every day on Twitter, mainly in the Brooklyn, Manhattan area, that are Nets fans. So don't tell me that nobody in the five boroughs root for, roots for the Nets. That's just wrong. Also, it's really annoying to me, and it's just kind of illogical that Knicks fans will say like, you know, this city will never turn into net city. The, you know, you're, you're never going to have majority stake. We know that. We know Manhattan isn't going to become Brooklyn Nets territory, okay? We're not the Manhattan Nets. We're not the New York Nets. We're the Brooklyn Nets. If we can grow in Brooklyn, if we can take over Brooklyn, then Manhattan has a rival to the East that's going to be very dangerous, that's going to have years in the making of just unbelievable basketball, of anger, of competition, of, of entertainment. So, don't sit here and be like shitting on us because most people born in New York or in the greater area have been Knicks fans for over 30 to 50 years. Don't, don't tell, don't, don't rub it in our face. They're not going to convert. We're not trying to convert them. We're trying to take the younger generations. We're trying to build up. We're trying to create a fan base for the future. Okay. Just like the Knicks are creating a roster to win 15 years from now, we're creating a fan base to follow for the next 15 years to grow together. So 50 years from now, we have just as big of a following in Brooklyn as they do in Manhattan comparatively. And I'm glad you brought that up because this is my final point on, on this whole situation. And then, then we'll move on. It's great that the Knicks are good again for the area, for the NBA in general, but let's not act like they aren't an overachieving, well-coached young team that has absolutely been peaking as of late, as opposed to say a Milwaukee or a Philadelphia that have played well all season. That are the two and three seeds respectively right now. Julius Randle deserves MVP consideration. Probably not a top two candidate, but I would say three or four. He is absolutely, absolutely going to win the most improved player this year. RJ Barrett and Reggie Bullock have been very nice pieces. Derek Rose was a nice addition. Emmanuel quickly looks like he can be sort of a Lou Williams, have that type of career. And I don't blame Knicks fans for being happy with their recent success. You should be a nine game winning streak is nothing to scoff at might be 10 after tonight, but they are not on the same level as the Brooklyn Nets when it comes to actually playing basketball. Every game the Nets have beat them. Has it been close? Absolutely. But the Nets are are 3-0 against them this year. If they play in a playoff series, 
the Nets will absolutely beat them in five or six games. I'm not saying it'll be a sweep. I think the Knicks will squeak out a few wins, but let's not get it twisted. The Nets are the big brother to the Knicks when it comes to actually playing basketball. I agree. And if you look at the Knicks, what was a nine game winning streak they're on right now? Before that, they lost to the Nets, lost to the Celtics, and then went on a winning streak playing very subpar teams, Grizzlies, Raptors twice, Hornets, Pelicans. Uh, they had one good win. They had a good win over the Mavs. Besides that, if they beat the Suns tonight, okay, I'll give them that. But I don't think there were any – I think only the Mavs was the only team in playoff contention. They beat a Hawks team that was kind of beat up. So just just not – I'm not going to sit here and say and then shit on a nine game win streak. And I'm not going to say the Knicks don't deserve to be in the position they are now, but beat us, beat the bucks. Okay. Beat the, beat the, 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 they beat the Lakers without LeBron or, or maybe with LeBron without AD. They beat a beat up Lakers. No, it was beat, both. I think they beat them without either of those guys. Either of those guys beat a contender. Okay. Yes. And, and add to this win streak and have some clout. And then we can talk. Don't beat subpar teams go 0 and 3 against us and then tell us you'd rather have your players than our players. One final thing on this, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of Knicks fans extremely enthusiastic about the culture around the team. Thibodeau's a great coach, Randall's a good leader. All the guys kind of look up to the veterans and Randall and D-Rose and Bullock. Um, you see the word culture thrown out there a lot. And someone someone wrote something on Twitter. It's funny, culture is thrown out a lot when a team is just getting good right? The Nets don't have to preach culture because they already developed that over the last four years. And I'll tell you this, you and I watch a lot of Nets games. How excited are guys for each other when a teammate does something uh, highlight worthy? For example, Blake Griffin takes a charge. You see the bench stand up. Jeff Green throws down a vicious dunk. Everybody on the bench goes nuts. Kyrie is always Kevin Durant's biggest cheerleader and vice versa. These guys on the Brooklyn Nets know what their role is. They know what their goals are. And they're always constantly rooting for each other and showing their enthusiasm for their teammates success. So I don't, you know, I'm not, this is not a knock on the Knicks. The Knicks have a great culture that they're building, but I just want it known that the Nets are not one of those great teams where they're, you know, the chemistry isn't there. They're not rooting for each other. Even though Kevin Durant hasn't been on the court a ton, even though Harden's missed a ton of games as of late, everybody on this team wants their teammates to succeed. And that's something that I think you and I see on a nightly basis. Yeah. You're, I mean, yeah. The, the point being, even though there are a bunch of superstars on the team, this isn't an ego competition. This, this yeah. isn't the 2017, 2018 warriors that after the aftermath was that everyone hated everyone. Durant and green hated each other that, you know, now they're dissing each other on Twitter left and right. Yes. It, it's really nice to see, especially Harden and Durant when they're out on their feet, yes. jumping up and down for Landry Shamet and Bruce Brown. I agree. The Nets do have more character, more heart uh, than we had probably expected ourselves throwing Harden, Durant, Kyrie all in the same pool. So that is very nice to see. Again, no shade on the Knicks. I, I will always hate the organization as a Nets fan. I will say Thibodeau was the I think best. It's, Thibodeau. it's not the, the H is silent. That's not how I pronounce it. Okay. Yeah, they do call him Tibbs. He was the best decision they've made in the last 10 years. All right, let's move on. Uh, a few segments before we go through these slates of a slate of games that we played this last week. Slate, no pun intended. Shout out Slate Chocolate Milk. This podcast is sponsored by Slate it's, Chocolate Milk. It's not milk. sponsored by Slate Chocolate Milk, but we drink Slate Chocolate Milk. Let's just leave it at that. Um, this segment's called Rappaport's a Hypocrite. So I saw a TikTok yesterday that annoyed the absolute hell out of me. Michael Rappaport obviously feuded with Kevin Durant in the last few weeks. They had this stupid Twitter exchange, or I'm sorry, Instagram exchange. Rappaport uh, basically outed Kevin Durant and, and showed all these terrible you know, texts and, and Instagram messages that Durant was sending Rappaport. Rappaport was then ridiculed by everyone, called a narc, rat, whatever. He then went on in either ESPN or Fox Sports show. I don't remember which show it was. I think it was Fox Sports. And basically cried to the cameras saying he can't go to his favorite coffee shop, this and that, whatever. Basically portrayed himself as a victim. Now, that's all good and dandy. But in this TikTok video I saw, Rappaport has either his son or his nephew or an intern kid that follows him around. And the video consists of Rappaport getting in some sort of like a joke argument with the kid the video ends with the kid saying, I bought you a Durant jersey. And Rappaport goes, fuck you. And then they posted the video. And he posted it, obviously, thinking it was funny. But 
my what drives me nuts is you can't go on television and start crying about the whole situation with Kevin Durant and this and that and and being called out a narc whatever you know he threatened you you thought you were whatever defending yourself but then you still poke fun at the situation like pick a lane you you can't do that that really bothered me and it's just another reason why this dude absolutely stinks I don't have much to say. It's like a waste of breath giving Rappaport attention because that's all he wants, dude. He's an irrelevant dude. No one no one is missing Rappaport content these days. So he's trying to be a little controversial and edgy and hoping to stir some shit up. That's all I'm going to say. It's not really worth talking about. It's just stupid. And I, I think he has lost the seven fans that he's had. All right. Let's move on to this next segment. It's called Welcome to the Brooklyn Nets Fan Base. Andrew Yang. Yang was on Keyshawn, J. Will, and Zubin yesterday morning, and he clarified that he is, in fact, a Nets fan. He used to like the Knicks. He stopped rooting for the Knicks because of James Dolan and how he handled the Jeremy Lin situation. He said he's glad the Knicks are now good. It's good for the city, but he is 100% rooting for the Nets to take home the championship trophy, and he'd root for the Nets in a playoff series with the Knicks. Very happy to have Andrew Yang in our corner. Nick, what do you what did you think of this news? It's pretty cool. I mean, Jeremy Lin was on the Nets too, which was awesome. I mean, that, you know, you have a reason to also root for the Nets because Lin was there and Lin had a couple solid seasons, got a fat contract that he might not have warranted, but uh, it was good to see him in a Nets jersey. Uh, that's awesome. I mean, Dolan sucks, and I don't blame anybody for wanting to be with a more respectable professional organization that doesn't treat people like shit, say awful things, and make just bad decisions for a team that has so much potential, such a big following, and a shitload of money. So I have I, I welcome Yang. I have no uh, fault or blame for him leaving. Yes, it's great that he's coming to the Nets. You know, people will sit there and call him a traitor uh, and say how you know you're rooted in Knicks fan. How can you just get up and leave? That's a good reason. That's not like my friends who, when the New Jersey Nets moved to Brooklyn said, now we're Knicks fans because our team left, even though the Knicks are in another, the same state that the Nets went to. That's not a reason. Okay. This is Dolan's a piece of shit. That's a good reason. I respect it. And we welcome him with open arms and open legs. Well, I would say we absolutely welcome Andrew Yang to come on the Fireside Nets podcast. If he ever so desires, we, we would love to have you on, talk Nets, talk about how the Knicks suck. Uh, that'd be great. All right, Nick, let's get to these games. So we'll start, as we always do, with the latest game that was on Sunday. The Nets beat the Phoenix Suns 128 to 119. This was Kevin Durant's return, 33 points in 28 minutes. He came off the bench. I think he played in the second quarter with about three or four minutes left but 33 points in 28 minutes on 12 of 21 from the field. He was great. Kyrie Irving started the game off smoking hot. He had 34 points and 12 assists. Blake Griffin, 16 points and some excellent defense throughout the game on DeAndre Ayton, on Chris Paul. No, no matter who Blake Griffin's covering, he always is able to just kind of get his – the guy he's defending to take a tough shot. And sometimes they make it. Sometimes they don't. Most of the times he covered Aiton. Aiton wasn't scoring on those possessions. Uh, 10 points apiece for Joe Harris and Jeff Green. Jeff Green has been cold as of late shooting, but he had two ridiculous dunks in this game. One, he gathered himself and dunked with the left over Mikhail Bridges. The other, he came from the baseline, went to the middle of the court, and then basically windmilled it and cranked it up, jammed it, on Frank Kaminsky. Kaminsky had a bad day. He also um, had an and one where he got hit by Durant. Durant hit the shot, and, and that was an and one that Kaminsky thought should have been a charge. DeAndre Jordan, another net who had a decent game, six points and 12 rebounds for him, but a very solid defensive effort on his part. Um, what did you think of this Nets win against Phoenix, Nick? It was a great win. Uh, Suns were missing Jay Crowder, I believe. And you know who stepped up for them? Torrey Craig, 20 and 14 rebounds. Uh, I like Craig coming over from the Nuggets. That was a good pickup. Um, I saw solid basketball by both teams. And you know what to me was the kind of the deciding factor that put us over the hump? 
it was that we have Kyrie Irving and they have Chris Paul. And I am the biggest Chris Paul supporter. I, I think he's been undervalued as he gets older over the last five years. He is an unbelievable leader. He is an amazing passer. He is clutch when he needs to be and when he needs to put the team on his back. But this was the first game in a while where I, where I thought Chris Paul's age was obvious. I thought he got out guarded. I mean, out point guarded, like skill wise by everyone on the nets. I thought Kyrie Irving made Chris Paul look 45. And I think when it came down to it, you have Booker doing all he can do. Booker's unbelievable. He's he's, just insane shots. He is fun to watch. 36 for Devin Booker, 12 of 24 from the field, four of five from three. And he was eight of nine from the free throw line. There you go. And DeAndre Ayton was hard for us to control on the boards. I mean, Ayton is a better big man right now than DeAndre Jordan and Blake Griffin. Well, so the problem with Aiton, Aiton ended up with 20 points and 13 rebounds. And in the beginning- He got in foul trouble. He did get in foul trouble. But in the beginning of the game, the Suns were making the Nets switch with smaller players. So Aiton would have Irvin on him, or he'd have uh, Bruce Brown or Landry Shaman, and he would just score. Um, The Nets made the adjustment eventually to start doubling DeAndre Aiton later in the game, and it worked. They really made Aiton feel uncomfortable in the post, even with the switches. So a lot of the times, I don't even think DeAndre Jordan was really covering DeAndre Aiton for a ton of possessions, but they were able to irritate Aiton. And that's why I think Blake Griffin, and I just put out a YouTube video, check check out our YouTube page, Fireside Nets. Blake Griffin is so important to this team, not only on the offensive side of, side of things, but defensively. I mean, he, he did not back down from Aiton. He really made life difficult for him all night. There was a great sequence with where, where Griffin was covering Chris Paul and he forced Chris Paul into a difficult shot. Paul missed. Nets come back the other way. Griffin gets it in the post. He has Paul on him and he scores. And it's funny because the one highlight that kind of came out in garbage time, Chris Paul shook Griffin with a crossover. Remember that behind the back? Griffin fell on his ass. Paul hit the layup. That was posted everywhere on TikTok and Instagram. But that was when the Suns were down nine points with a minute left, the game was over. Paul, uh, I'm sorry, Griffin absolutely dominated every matchup he had for the Suns. 16 points for Griffin. He was, he was very fun to watch in this one. Um, the Nets, the, you know, when they have two out of the big three and those guys are going for 67 points in a game, all the role players have to do is enough. If you look at the score sheet, no one outside of those three guys I just mentioned had a great game. I mean, Jeff Green, 10 points, 5 of 11 from the field. Joe Harris, 10 points, 4 of 10 from the field. Uh, Jordan only had six. Shamit had five. Bruce Brown had four. You know, Tyler Johnson, by the way, returned in this one. He had eight points. He hit two, two three-pointers. He has a cool little, like, pony, too. Little, oh, yeah, uh, his, his hair was rocking. His hair was rocking on Sunday. So my point is this. If you have two out of the big three, you just need your role players to do enough. And I think they did more than enough against the Suns on Sunday. And it's kind of crazy – that we just clearly looked more talented and outplayed the Suns. And the Suns didn't play poorly. Like we said, Aiden at 20, Booker 36, he's their guy. Paul 14, Torrey Craig 20. They had a shot. I think we shot 52, they shot 47. They were, it's not like we were unbelievably outplaying them. It's not like they couldn't shoot. We just had more firepower. And the crazy thing to think about is the Suns are 42 and 18. They have a better record than us. They're in second place in the West, which is a much more competitive division. We're 41 and 20 right now. So they not only on paper look better than us, just in terms of record and, and where they've gotten from where they've been right now, we're in first place in the East, but they are a scary team that everyone is talking about. And we made them look like a young, vulnerable inexperienced team that even when they play their near best, like I said, yes, could Chris Paul have played better? They were missing Jay Crowder, who is a role player, but a solid uh, starter on their team. He hits his shots and he's a great defender. They still could not keep up with us. And then again, it wasn't like we were playing out of our mind. It wasn't like this was a a one-sided game. This wasn't, you know, Durant had 50, Irving Irving had 45. They both had uh, early 30s, which was solid, but this wasn't anything other than both teams playing their best, a competitive game, and the more talented team won. That's all it was. This could be a finals matchup. We'll see. I mean, the Suns right now are, are two in the West. Um, they don't make Suns don't make it to the championship. Talk to me a little bit before we move on. What you thought of Kevin Durant's return and his performance? I mean, what was your favorite shot? He had everything in his bag. 
He posted up Chris Paul and just basically whooshed right by him for the slam. He hit a few three pointers in this game. I believe KD was two of three from th three point range. And then just his, his shots. I mean, the one handed jump shot, uh, the, the pass from Irving where he was right outside the post, essentially just put the game away. He, He's unbelievable, man. What did you think of his performance? I turned to my roommate, Eric. Must have been the second quarter when he came in and started to just hit his shots right off the bat. And I said, I've never seen somebody come back from injury and act like, and just never miss a beat. He has never, at least in this year from what I've seen, he has never come back from missing games, no matter how many games, and needed to warm up and needed to like get, get back into the groove. He comes back and just starts right back up every time. He hits his shots when he's open. He's smooth. His, he's, his stroke is consistent. He doesn't need to learn, you know, in the moment mentally how to get back in there. He has no fear. He's not playing shy. He's not scared to go at someone. He's not scared to jab, step, fade away, and shoot. He's not scared of stepping on the wrong foot, bending his knee or ankle in the wrong direction, messing up his hammy. I've just never seen someone come back from missing multiple games, getting hurt, hurting two different parts of their body, and then literally – for a second, you did not doubt that he was going to be Kevin Durant. Not one moment. Doesn't miss a beat. And I actually heard something post-game. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I guess Nash asked KD whether or not he wanted to start or come off the bench. And Durant's response was something along the lines of, and I'm paraphrasing here, I want to come off the bench because I know that'll be a challenge for me. To just go into a game where guys have been playing and, and sort of have to find my rhythm in a game that's already been played for one and a half quarters or, or something like that. But basically Kevin Durant, you know, it's easy for him to say, yeah, let put, put me in the starting lineup. Let me play with Kai. Let me do this and that. But he's like, nah, I'm going to come off the bench. I, I want to be put in a situation where, you know, it's not uh, handheld for me. It's, it's not fed on a spoon. Like I have to go out if they're down 10, I have to play this way. If they're up 10, whatever. And I just thought that was really interesting that like that, that's the challenge that, that, you know, that's the type of guy KD is. He just wants to challenge himself to be a better basketball player every single time he steps out there. I think my favorite KD play was with like three minutes left in the fourth quarter when they sealed the deal and he just drove and had an and one uh, to just end the game and just kind of, I think we went up uh, uh, 12 or 13 at that point. And there was no chance the Suns were coming back till the last minute He's going hard. We, we have a lead. It was a, it was a comfortable lead. It was double digits. And he still went hard to the hoop, smacked the backboard, finished and got the end one just to seal the deal, just to punch Chris Paul in the throat. Metaphor. Bro Brooklyn, we go hard. And the final thing I'll say about this game, it's funny that you're a big Chris Paul supporter because I absolutely, I, I love Chris Paul's game, but I just hate how like he just has this ego when he's on the court and you know, you saw it a little bit when him and Blake Griffin were going at it, but like he wants to bully guys, Chris Paul, and he got bullied in this one. Every time he was on Kyrie, Kyrie scored. Every time he was on KD or Blake Griffin, those guys essentially scored. This was a bad game for Chris Paul. He was exposed defensively, and I, for one, loved to see it. All right, I Nick. Mean, he's 35 or 36. I don't care how old he is. Feet tall. Don't, tell, don't talk to me about age when Jeff Green is dunking on every single human being alive at age 33. I don't, I don't want to hear it. Jeff Green's like the sixth guy on the team. Chris Paul's literally their number two. They're not comparable. Mm -hmm. And also what I'll say is you'd have an ego too if you fucking made State Farm money. That's a good point. If I made Cliff Paul money. All right, let's get into the Brooklyn Nets New Orleans game. This was played on Tuesday night. The Nets won 134 to 129. Kyrie, 32 points, eight assists in this one. Joe Harris had 24. Shamit added 18. Blake Griffin had 16. And Jeff Green had 15. Bruce Brown with 11, TLC with 10. Um, by the way, TLC might be out of the rotation moving forward, but we'll see. Easy, easy enough game for the Nets. They handled business. I mean, you know, it was Zion Williamson and, and Brandon Ingram. Zion had 33, Ingram had 27. Outside of those two guys, no one really had a great game. Um, this, this was a close game, though. I, I mean, you know, the Pelicans made a push late. Uh, Kyrie made some excellent defensive plays. He, he kind of picked Zion's pocket with about 30, 25 seconds left. It went off Zion's leg. Ball went back to the Nets. The game was essentially over. Um, the Nets scored 41 points in the fourth. You love to see that. What were your takeaways from this win against the Pelicans? 
It's the Joey Buckets game, dude. He couldn't miss. 24 points. His threes were raining down. Um, this was another game that shouldn't have been as close as it was. Well, we won by five. We only have one going into the fourth quarter. I don't think the Nets played great in this one. I mean, it was one, you're right. It was one of those games should have been a 20 point win, but because of, you know, the way the Pelicans played, the way they're coached by Stan Van Gundy, the Nets got a little bit sloppy uh, on defense at times. Um, then the Pelicans made a, made a run. I mean, the only reason the Nets were able to close them out is, is because the Nets made some plays on defense, but this game easily could have went to overtime. I mean, Zion and Brandon Ingram are both fantastic. I will say that I'm not, I'm a big Zion guy. I've never been a big Ingram guy. I'm not a big fan of his game and his attitude, but he he's pretty knocked down when he needs to be. I think they have a good future together too. Eric Bledsoe didn't show up for this one. Um, the weird thing the Nets do though, and I think it's sometimes because of our lack of defense or our lack of transition defense as well, is they make guys you've never heard of look yes. like they have a future in the NBA, like Najee Marshall yeah. at 15, seven and six. And I kept hearing his name throughout the game. Like Marshall was another one. Marshall makes the great pass. And I'm like only against the Nets sometimes when we're kind of caking on offense and slacking on defense, do they take a guy like Najee Marshall and make him look like now a third piece of the Pelicans roster that's like going to, you know, grow into something uh, consistent and special. So that's my one complaint from the game besides, you know, it shouldn't have been as close as it was. You just had a guy who averages five points a game, drop 15 and make it look easy on sometimes on our guys. But this is a solid win. We had a great point distribution down the line. If you look at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven guys in double digits, that's what sharing the basketball gets you. Um, that's what always looking for the next guy selflessness gets you. So a solid win an expected win. I've said that in the past when we have games like this, where we should be winning when the, the best two guys on the Pelicans are Zion and Brandon Ingram, who accumulated have what six years in the NBA, and we have veterans like Blake Griffin, Jeff Green, we have Kyrie Irving and Joe Harris doing their thing. So, uh, an expected win should have been a little uh, better of a win, should have been a little more decided earlier on, but uh, we got the job done. We had a back to back after that game on Tuesday night. We played the Raptors on Wednesday night, and the funny thing about this game, Nick, is we came out in that first quarter and we were smoking. I mean, we scored 36 points in the first to the Raptors, 23 Kyrie continued his, his scorching hot streak. He was great in that first, nobody could miss. And then all of a sudden the Nets forgot how to play basketball. The next three quarters, the Raptors would score 33 to the Nets, 22 in the second 36 to the Nets, 23 in the third. And then they both scored 22 a piece in the fourth. Whereas the game was over for me, this was a bad Kyrie Irvin game. I mean, I just wasn't crazy about his performance. I thought he dogged it at times on defense. He bailed out the Raptors on offense with a lot of just kind of subpar, bring up the ball and just shoot a three shots. And even though he ended up with eight assists, I, I just wasn't crazy about how many times he didn't even look to pass and get guys involved in this one. There were moments in that third quarter where the Nets could have made a run if they had just moved the ball a little bit. I understand, you know, when it's just one out of the big three, like this was just Kyrie Irvin, he's not James Harden. He's not going to be, you know, making guys better on every single possession. That's not to say he can't pass the ball. That's not to say that, you know, he hasn't been averaging close to 10 assists in, in Harden's absence. He has been. But his his play style is a score first mentality. And unfortunately, against a Raptors team that's really good on defense, you can't half-ass that. And it just looked to me like at times he was half-assing it. Now let's give the Raptors credit. Everyone in their starting lineup ended up playing great. Siakam had 27. Anobi had 25. They killed us all night. Lowry and Van Vliet kind of slept walk through that first, first half. But Lowry ended up with 14 and Van Vliet ended up with 17 respectively. They essentially hit some shots to close us out in the fourth. Um, bad decisions on offense. And the lack of defense is what killed us. I thought in that third quarter, there were just moments where the Raptors would have these wide open threes and the closest Nets player wouldn't be within five feet of them. And it, it was really hard for me to watch. I understand you're on the second half of a back-to-back. -back. You're kind of expected to lose those games. The Nets historically have a terrible record against the Raptors, but just have a little bit more pride in your defense. And, and, and move the ball on offense a little bit more. And that's a message directly to Kyrie Irving. So wasn't crazy about this game. Really thought that it should have been closer. What were your thoughts? It's called a trap game. 
I bet my for my Raptors fan friend on the Nets. And that first half was such a tease. And that first half was such a Lowry's old, Van Vliet's washed up. You got two two chubby point guards who are, who are aging and only had one season where they both went off. That, that championship with Kawhi was an anomaly and that team's never going to be good again. Uh, you have Siakam who's so overrated. He's never going to carry a team. And then first half ends and we think we're in the clear and the second half's just an entirely different game. Lowry and Van Vliet say, fuck you to my face and start hitting every shot they take. Siakam's hitting his open threes and he's a, a sub 35% three-point shooter. I think he's a, a 28% three-point shooter if I'm not mistaken, if I heard that correctly. So this was a tease. It was a trap. It was a marathon that we got outrun towards the end. Uh, we lost our sizzle. We, we, we put too much into that first half, expecting the second half to be a breeze, and we got stomped on. So I lost $5 on this one, but more so I lost uh, a lot of energy and anger released um it was frustrating and i i don't like the raptors and i've always 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 said to that they should never be building a team around siakam or thinking he's going to be uh, better than he is because he is not the future of the organization he is this is kind of him peaking if that he was a great number two uh small forward to Kawhi. he was a great guy you know when Kawhi draws a double siakam cuts to the rim and he's he's tall and lanky he can finish usually get an and one um, but this team is just not good enough to go far. The Raptors, I also, OG Ananobi, I really enjoy watching him play because he is a quiet scorer. He is a guy who takes a backseat to Siakam, Van Vliet, and Lowry. And even like Boucher comes in and fires more shots than him. But OG Ananobi can hit threes. He is consistent from three. He could slam it home. And he is a top-notch defender. This guy and this is going to be the greatest comparison he's ever had in his life, is kind of like a poor man's Kawhi where he's so quiet, he takes a backseat to everybody, he really needs to start stepping up. He, to me, has a higher ceiling than Siakam if they let him grow into that player. You got rid of Powell, you got rid of some guys off the bench, you have a, their second unit, the Raptors, did you, did you read the names on their second unit when they came in? Yeah, in the Gillespie, quarter, Flynn, Trent, Watan, Watanabe, Trent Ken Birch. Yeah, Ken, Ken Burch. Jr. Ken started for them. Ken Burch like he looks like he plays half asleep or stoned every day. <laughs> um, so bad, bad, bad loss. But I will give the Nets a break based on fatigue. But OG Ananobi, that guy deserves more attention. He always kills us, man. Ananobi, Lowry, they always kill us. I wasn't, you know, I, I don't get super annoyed if we lose a game and we play hard. What, what bothered me about this one is I just don't think we wanted to play after the first quarter. Like we really didn't want to be there. And, and it, it showed, it showed, you know, forget about fatigue for a second. It just the effort and the lack of intensity on defense and Kyrie was just, you know, tunnel vision, Chuck and Kyrie. It was a tough loss, but I digress. It was the only loss that the Nets had this week. We, we finish, you know, going over these games with our matchup against the Celtics on Friday night, the Celtics were playing with no Jalen Brown in this one. No Kemba Walker. They still had Jason Tatum. I mean, Tatum had 38 and 10 in this one. Peyton Pritchard added 22 for the Celtics and Marcus Smart had 19. But those were the only three guys in double figures. Uh, this really wasn't a game. I mean, outside of the first quarter, the Nets dominated. 39 points to the Celtics, 26 in the second, 28 to 22 in the third. The Celtics would go on to make a run to try to make things close in the fourth, but the Nets were able to kind of finish the deal. Uh, Joe Harris, leading man for the Nets with 20 points, four of seven from three-point land for him. Kyrie, only 15 points for Kyrie, but I just like the way he played so much more in this one than he played against the Raptors. 11 assists, nine rebounds. He was one rebound shy of a triple-double, and – he was just trying to get guys involved and you knew he was going to show up because he always shows up against Boston. Uh, Bruce Brown had 15 points, Blake Griffin with 13 and Jeff green with 19. Um, Nets didn't shoot it relatively well, 43%, 34% from three, but they, they were just able to kind of outplay the Celtics for, for most of this game. I, I mean, they didn't even, the, the defense wasn't that great. 40% for the Celtics and 40.5% from three, you know, they couldn't stop Tatum, but they were able to pretty much stop everybody else. Nobody for the Celtics hit shots outside of, of Tatum and Pritchard. So, you know, you expect to win these games when a team like the Celtics doesn't have 
two out of their three best players on the team. Um, I was happy with this one. I was actually watching with a few Celtics fans and they wanted me to turn off the game in the third quarter. So you, you know, game, it was good. This game was honestly kind of a dud until the fourth quarter when the Celtics made a run and cut it to three. At one it was point. a boring game. Yeah. It was a, it was a low scoring, ugly game. Uh, it was, what was it? Um, yeah. 43%. We shot, and that was the max on the game Every for, from the field. The, the Celtics shot 40. Yeah, there weren't a lot of shots going in. There wasn't a lot of star power. I got to tip my hat to Jason Tatum. I'm kind of a Tatum hater. I've always been more of a Jalen Brown guy. I just like the way Brown plays more than Tatum. I like his attitude more. Um, you know, and Tatum's been called out this year for his leadership as well by the brilliant Kendrick Perkins. Uh, so I'll give credit where credit's due. Tatum is a fucking beast. But at the end of the day, they didn't have enough uh, in the tank against us. It was, again, not even uh, like Kyrie went off. It wasn't even like we had guys who were scoring 30 and dropping the hammer. It was just an ugly, slow, we happened to just edge them out towards the end there. The Celtics made a run, made it interesting. My, my Boston Dick friends were texting me thinking that they had come back enough and Tatum was about to take over. It wasn't enough. We, we had more in the tank. So I hate the Celtics. Not as much as I hate the Knicks, but I hate the Celtics. And I also think that they are, are fucking themselves over by getting Fournier. That to me was just a bad decision. Bad, bad trade, bad move by Ainge. Look, I think Ainge is on his way out. If he doesn't, if he doesn't win a title in these next two or three years, that's a lot of seasons with Tatum and Brown essentially wasted. Um, the one thing I will say about this game that was interesting, we got the debut of Mike James. Eight points in 21 minutes, but most importantly, he just looked like a competent backup to Kyrie Irvin while Harden and Choyoza are out. He made good decisions, hit some tough shots. He was a plus 17 from the field. What do you think of Mike James's debut? He's quick, man. He's got a good first step, and he looks super athletic. Just the way he moves confidently as well. Um, to me, <laughs> my first impression was more Jax Chioza. It was like bigger, stronger yeah. Chioza. Yeah. Yeah. I At got... first, literally, Eric turns to me. He goes, who is that? I go, did Chioza just like turn into a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? He just looks like like a much bigger, scarier Chioza. Yeah. No, I, I liked his game. He hit that one running baseline three, which was one of the most bizarre shots I've ever seen a player take in their debut, but it went in. So kudos to him on that. Um, he reminded me of like Darren Williams, but when Darren Williams was with the Nets in those last few years and with the Cavaliers that one season, that's who Mike James reminded me of. Yeah, he's like Darren Williams, except he actually comes to a team and wants to win. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Nick, let's get to our final segment of the show. You and I are going to rank the top three teams that we want to play in the playoffs. Now, before we do that, I just have a quick standings update. The Brooklyn Nets are now 41 and 20. They are one game ahead of the Philadelphia 76ers for the one seed. So hopefully the Nets in these next few weeks can hang on. And that would be great to have home court advantage throughout the playoffs. All right, let's get to this segment. So you want to start three and go two, one, or you want to do one, two, three? How do you want to do it? Um, we can, we can start three, two, one. So this is okay. teams that we, that we prefer to play in the first round, right? I was just thinking teams that we want to see the Nets play in the playoffs. doesn't have to, it can be in the Eastern conference finals, but the matchups that we want, that we think would, I guess, be easiest for the Nets, or if we just want to see them like beat down a rival or something along those lines. All right, well, I'm going to tell you two teams that I'm going to rule out that I don't want to see would be the Wizards and the Heat. I'll tell you what, I don't know why the Wizards give us a, a run for our money with their shitty team if they happen to make the playoffs. They're, they're three games back from eighth right now. And the Heat, too. I know they beat us up last time. They're just like a, a weird, scary matchup. Um, in terms of what they're able to do as well on offense, because they're kind of like us, where the only big guy on the team is Bam, so they can run fast, they can play hard, they have a bunch of guards who could drive and dish, Bam could stretch the floor as well, Duncan's knocked down, he's kind of like a, a little bit worse version of our Joe Harris there, so I don't want to play the Heat, who I'd want to play first name off the top of my head, who we wouldn't match up with right now unless they lost like four of their next whatever, would be the Knicks, to be honest, to shut Knicks fans up. If we could play the Knicks in the first round, and we can knock them out and not hear any Knicks fans for the rest of the uh, the playoffs, 
that would be ideal. I also like our matchup against the Knicks. I just think we would just overall destroy them. The only person on the team we've had any difficulty with ever has been Julius Randle because we don't really have that kind of beast bigger body to match up down low. He's kind of too quick and versatile for DeAndre Jordan. Uh, and Blake Griffin can take a couple charges. He wouldn't be able to keep up either. So you I don't think versus- that KD can cover Randall if need be. I think he would get in foul trouble pretty quickly. I think okay. I think Randall does a spin up and under and, and KD's a little too late on this on the on the block and slaps him around a little bit okay. a couple times in a row. I think if we switch and we double like we did to Aiton, but again, Randall is a lot more uh, top of the key guard prone than Aiton is. Randall could do a lot more off the dribble. So first team that comes to my head is Knicks. Would love to beat him in the first round. Yeah, that's my number three too. Um, obviously, if, if things continue the way they are, we're not going to see the Knicks until the second round if they stay the fourth seed uh, and we win the first round. But I, I want to shut Knicks up. Knicks fans up. I want to shut them up. I, I want to play the Knicks. I want to beat them in five or six games. I think that's how – I don't think we're going to sweep the Knicks. I think the Knicks squeak out a, a win or two against us, but I want big brother to smack little brother on the Heine. Thibodeau, great coach, not going to beat Steve Nash, and Steve Nash is his first season with KD and, and Kyrie, and hopefully James Harden is healthy for that series as well. Speaking of the Knicks, the Knicks' win streak ends at nine because they lost to the Phoenix Suns 118-118. 110 Booker had 33 Paul had 20 Mikhail Bridges had 21 for the Suns for the Knicks Derek Rose had 22 Randall had 18 Bullock and Barrett with 17 the Knicks now fall to 34 and 28 the Suns improved to 43 and 18 so nice little Knicks loss towards the end of the podcast as we're talking about playing them in the playoffs not going to say anything I bet they played a great game I have respect they lost I'm not going to shit on it Good job to the Suns. You don't have to shit on anybody. Why are you always talking about shitting on things? Number two, I'm going to go with the Celtics for similar reasons. Fucking despise the Celtics. Uh, uh, We also pretty much um, gave the Celtics all of their firepower right now in our dumb trades for Pierce Garnett uh, and that whole crew. And that, you know, went down as arguably the worst decision in the Nets franchise. So I want to beat up on the Celtics. I think they now made the stupid decision with Fournier. And again, no shade on Fournier. I've just been talking about that magic team that has been building with bad players over the last five years. It was like Vucevic was by far the only baller. And then you had Fournier, um, Terrence Ross, Jonathan Isaac, DJ Augustine at one point, who's my boy, but still just not good enough to ever be a, a playoff contending team. So you get a guy who's a little older, a little slower, and not big enough to dominate down low and you get rid of Tice. So it was a weird, weird decision by the Celtics. I kind of want to beat up on them to prove that at the end of the day, even though we took Pierce and Garnett off their hands for the Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum pick guys, we're still going to win a shit before they do. Every time you pound on your desk, it comes through on the mic. Yeah, I'm making points and I want to listen and hear the point. They might not know that. So just letting you know. Okay, my number two team, uh, this is tough for me. I wanted to say the Wizards because I want to beat the Wizards in the playoffs, but the Wizards are the hottest team in the league right now. I don't want to play the Wizards. I'll play the Charlotte Hornets. I don't think Lamella Ball is going to be healthy for that first round. They're very young. They're very inexperienced. I I think the Nets would just trample the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, Yes, Miles Bridges, not to be confused with the Phoenix Suns, Mikhail Bridges. Miles Bridges has been very impressive for the Hornets. Not to be confused with the movie 21 Bridges. Yes, not to be confused with the George Washington Bridge or the Tappan Zee Bridge. We're talking about Or the, or the Bridge to Terabithia. Yes, great movie, by the way. Um, Terry Rozier, Devontae Graham, great seasons. Lamella Ball, before he got hurt, was the rookie of the year. They're a great story. They're, they're, they're sort of like the Knicks, just not as successful. Um, right now they're sitting at the eight seed, so they would be in the play-in tournament. Uh, but out of those, those, there's four teams. I'll get to the fourth one. But out of the, the three teams, the Heat, the Hornets, and the Wizards, I would much rather play the Hornets than the Heat or the Wizards. I agree. The Hornets would be the easiest route for sure. Even the Hawks, if Trey Young's not back by then, uh, I think he is expected to just be ready around playoff time. But they, I think that would be a, a cakewalk as well without Young in that lineup. Even with Young, it, would, it wouldn't be too difficult. Now, the number one team that I want to see in the playoffs, I'm going to jump to the championship and say the Los Angeles Lakers. 
This is the matchup that everybody who loves basketball across the world has been wanting to see. Our big three versus LeBron and AD and now Drummond. Uh, if, you know, God willing, they're all healthy, which I hope they are. I don't want an asterisk on this championship. I want Harden, Kyrie, and KD to be healthy. I want all of the Lakers to be healthy, and I want to beat the Lakers. I was going to say in seven, but that would be really stress-inducing. So, you know, in whatever the shortest amount of games it takes, I want to prove to the world that we could beat LeBron. I am not a LeBron hater. I am not a yes, Michael Jordan's better than LeBron, but I'm not like just a guy who wants to see LeBron fail. I want to see the Nets Nets succeed on the biggest stage against the best uh, team in the league in the West when they are full throttle. Technically, they're not the best right now because I think the Jazz, Suns, uh, both have a better lineup, but you know what I mean. My number one matchup I want to see is the Nets versus the Pacers. I want to see Karis LeVert put up 35 to 40 points in a loss against the Brooklyn Nets. I think we would sweep the series. I think it would be great to watch Karis LeVert play in the playoffs again after everything that he's been through with Brooklyn after after his health scare in Indiana. Obviously, you know, he talks about how that trade was one of the greatest things to, to happen because the doctors were able to find that that mass on his kidney. But um, I, I would love to see the Nets just beat up on a Pacers. That is team. the most dull answer. You want to see us play the Indiana Pacers? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Just because you want us to win, but Karis LeVert to score? Malcolm Brogdon, Domantas, Domantas Sabonis. I, I want to see that matchup. I still don't think you pronounced it correctly. I think it's just Domantas Sabonis. I think I said it right the second time. Yeah, that's the matchup I want to see. This is a stupid answer. That's a stupid answer. All right. Speaking of stupid, stupid boy, speaking of stupid, um, I was just told that Chris Paul single-handedly beat the Knicks. So if we're using the logic that the Nets pretty much shut down Chris Paul, he comes back the next night on a second uh, back-to-back whatever and beats the Knicks. Eh, you know, no, you put two and two together, the Nets might be a better team than the Knicks. Well, he was the third leading scorer on the team behind Bridges and No, Booker, I, I so know, but I guess in the fourth quarter in the, in the last exactly. quarter. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the highlights, but good. Like I said, I like Chris Paul. He couldn't play against us, but if he could beat the Knicks, good. All right. Wow. That, is, wow. that is good. Wow. We're not doing an Owen Wilson thing this wow. episode, Nick. That does it for this week's episode of Fireside Nets with Spen and Nick, brought to you by wow. Empire Sports Media. Please check out our YouTube page. Nick and I have been doing a ton of post-game reactions right after the after the Nets games. We've been we've been streaming ourselves on on live. We're on Twitter. We're on uh, Instagram. We're on a ton of different devices. But all these videos get posted to YouTube, and then I also do some analysis analyses on certain Nets players, certain games, uh, everything Brooklyn Nets. So check it out, Fireside Nets on YouTube. Check out our TikTok. Follow us on Twitter if you don't already. Follow us on Instagram, any social media platform. We are on there. Nick has finally gotten a great mic. Thank you to wow. Alex. thank you to Alex Wilson. Thank you to Empire Sports Media for providing him that mic. And I mean that that does it for me, Nick. Happy birthday to Randy Shaman. It's her birthday tomorrow. Uh, you want to do the honors? Got you on the fireside. You know, really, you you know the my side. My Owen Wilson really sounds like little Nikki. I got you on the fire side. Yeah, that's my dad's the devil. Yeah, all right. We're we're ending it now.